Hello and welcome everybody. I'm Nick Dreesen with Families United Action Network. We are here tonight with Sherry Palmer from Texas and the National Family Law Institute. Uh, so we have some very exciting guests that uh, time to be able to bring her here tonight. Uh, this is, uh, uh, just got back from D.C. As you know, there was the Capital for Kids event that just happened and there was a lot of excitement that was going on so it, it's great that we are continuing to unite and for um, uh, yeah so we are excited to be back in Iowa but also excited that we are continuing to not unite all across the country as well as locally here in Iowa so uh, we're going to try and continue to carry on this movement to each and every state there's the capital for kids event that are being planned in all of the lower 48 states so make sure to continue to follow Okay, so um, there's Capital for Kids event that we're going to be doing in all the lower 48 states. There's going to be more information coming out about that. But um, go to the Americans for Equal Shared Parenting page and stay tuned to our Facebook page, which is Families Unite, United Action Network, Vaughn. Um, and also be sure to go to our website of familiesunite.org. So first off, we're going to bring up one of our Iowa affiliates here. This is with Ryan Knapp with Paternal Guardians of Iowa. So, Ryan? Name's Ryan Knapp uh, with Paternal Guardians of Iowa. Uh, what we do as an organization, we're a network of support and resource center for Iowa fathers. We help identify dads that are going to be positive and have healthy relationships with their children who are at risk of walking away due to the court system or if they don't have a network of support, financial means, um, or the knowledge to know what they need to do to be able to stay in their child's life through the custody process. Uh, I'm here to talk about kind of what we're doing on the, the side as well as helping fathers. We're currently right now during the election season identifying candidates, having those conversations, meeting them um, at coffee shops and just talking to them to get their feel of where they are on shared parenting and exactly uh, what their position, their views and thoughts. Um, from there, once we start that conversation, we get to the point of trying to identify is this someone that is just going to support this bill or is this someone that's actually going to be a real fighter for this bill and make sure that it's not going to die. Uh, once we have that, once I start building those relationships and they get comfortable, uh, I invite them to one of our meetings where they have the ability to present their case and kind of what their views and uh, opinions are on shared parenting to a group of about 50 people that tend to show up to these meetings. And there, the 50 people have the opportunity to see who their representatives are, who is also running in their district, and then have a clue uh, when, they, when it comes time to vote on who they can vote for that is going to support the shared parenting since they took a pledge when joining to support candidates that are going to push this issue. All right, thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, another part that I would touch on with the same little bit here on uh, candidates. If you are a candidate in Iowa watching this, um, uh, get a hold of us, message us. Um, uh, we will be contacting you after the primary election to, with a uh, survey that has some guidelines of some, we are requesting that you write an article for our website about custodial law or child protective services. There obviously has been a number of reasons for us to address these concerns and so we as a 501c3 cannot uh, endorse candidates but we can go ahead and share information in regards to the issues that we work on. So therefore we would uh, ask that you go ahead and write an article of your choice in regards to family law and we would publish that on our website with hyperlinks to your campaign site and any other information that you might like to have available in your article. So at this time, it is my honor, it is my privilege to bring up the one, the only, the great author from Texas, Ms. Sherry Palmer. So thank you. Hi everyone, I'm uh, very privileged and honored to speak with um, Families United Action Network tonight. And I am with National Family Law Policy Center. Uh, you'll probably recognize if any of you follow me that I am holding a book from our other company, that is not a nonprofit company, but we license these books to the Policy Center for educational purposes. And tonight, in order to keep the momentum going, I want to uh, provide a little bit of education for all of you on the language that you're putting in the bills. Because I noticed that there's been a lot of talk about, you know, how should we uh, craft the language in these bills, and is it okay for this, or is it okay for that? So first, before I do that, though, I want to talk to you just as a parent 
not necessarily as a, as some of you are lobbying, not as your lobbyist role, but as a parent, if you are going through this currently, <clears throat> excuse me, I've been trekking across the U.S. so the dust kind of gets to me. <clears throat> if you are going through this now, even if you do not have an equal parenting statute in your state, you do have rights to equal parenting. The Constitution is alive and well today. Um, regardless of whether or not it's in your statute, you do need to be getting educated on that information. You do need to be making sure that you're trying to argue that to the courts for the protection of your God-given right. And if you're not religious, um, your inalienable right to those fundamental parental rights and your child's right. Okay. So that this book that I'm holding up, which is the 20th Amendment, Protecting Parent-Child Bonds, um, it says that to you at the very beginning. That's why we wrote this book, so that parents understood to go ahead and fight for it in the court and then do your political part, right? It's very necessary that you do get involved in politics because the statutes are making it harder for you to actually exercise those rights, and you don't need that barrier there. We all know it's very, very costly and expensive. I think the average divorce right now, high conflict, is running about $70,000. So there are some numbers I've seen out there run about 30,000. Parents that come to us and attorneys, those aren't numbers that I'm seeing. I don't know about all of you guys, but I'm seeing a lot higher than 30,000. You guys agree or seen more? Than, okay. So I'm seeing a lot higher numbers than that. Now, of course, the numbers would be lower if the parents were already uh, lower income to begin with, but what I do see is that the courts will drain you as much income as you have. So if you're rich, they're going to be more expensive. They're going to keep you in court longer. So part of the combination of learning how to argue your rights in the courts and putting political pressure, part of the effort is to reduce the cost overall eventually, right? We all don't want to be in litigation. So let me tell you what this book does. <clears throat> This book was intended. <clears throat> excuse me. This book was intended to actually be pressed as a, an amendment to the United States Constitution. Right? We know it's very, very difficult to get that passed. <clears throat> so, what you can do is use the language that comes from it in your states, because every state has their own constitution. You don't have to get an amendment in it. I know, Mark, you might be cringing. Cringing, um, Mark Ludwig. I'm talking to you with AFDSP because. You talk about amendments attached to your state statute, that's not what I'm talking about. We all know there's amendments to the Constitution because we're all trying to get the courts to apply the 14th Amendment, right? Those are the amendments I'm talking about, and that is correct, Mark. We all know the amendments much better than you know the actual document of the Constitution, right? So, <clears throat> this book has eight clauses. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to have to grab my water real quick because my throat's not going to clear. So. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Thank you for your patience. All right. So this book has eight clauses. And before I read those clauses, we're going to go one by one. We'll go through this very quickly. I know you're all very busy and it's Memorial Day weekend. And I know for you parents that have your kids, you can watch this later because I think um, you'll have this up later on your page. Okay, so if you want to watch this later, it's going to be on Families United Action Network page. So you can view it when you're not spending time with your children. So the very end of this book is the author's final words. And what we say here is that no power has ever been found to be more suited to the protection of children than the natural bonding of parent and child. No state agency or divorce court judge can ever hope to match the level of care and devotion created by that parent-child bond. Supporting this amendment is our opportunity to ensure the parent-child bonds that play such a strong role in the lives of our children are protected to the utmost of our ability as a nation. So that gives you an idea that your power to protect your child is actually stronger than a judge's power. And why is that? Some of you might think, well, that's the judge's role, right? Protect my child. But in actuality, that judge is not there with your child every day. So it's really the judge's role to protect your ability to protect your child. 
So you have to get laws put into your state that protect your ability to do that, okay? So the first clause in this amendment that we wrote is the family unit clause. And that says, <clears throat> so bear with me for a minute, the most basic form of a protected private family unit is an individual parent and their minor child. The state may neither sever nor cross the boundaries of this family unit, except upon unfitness of the parent, parent and child share a right to free and equal association with each other. Now, a lot of you, if you've been active with Vaughn or you've been active with us, you know this, right? You understand that we've all been pushing for the presumption of a fit parent, right? Isn't that what you guys are doing right now? Presumption of equal custody, the, presume the parents are fit. So when you're doing that, you just have to be careful that the way you're forming the language, you aren't making it a moot point. And what I've seen in a lot of legislation is they will forget that you've got best interest in your statutes. Now I've seen a couple of the states now do this, and Kentucky just passed legislation where it said that it's in the best interest of the child to have equal parenting, right? So that's how they're kind of trying to show that the judge's discretion is limited. And when you're trying to get legislation, they kind of cringe, right? We don't want to limit the judge, but the way you explain that and address it is the Constitution already limits the judge. There is a reason that you have rights. Those are limits on the judge's power, right? So don't shy away from that. Just understand it and help explain it to your legislators. And then let them wrap their head around it. So instead of getting into arguments with each other or trying to get defensive about it, just say, okay, I understand how you might see it that way. You are correct. It is a limitation on the judge, but it's not one I'm creating, okay? And then tell your legislator, just asking them to help you guide the judges to do their job better and to preserve that oath that they make. Okay, so the family unit clause is easy, right? So you get that into your legislation, that's your equal parenting clause. <clears throat> and then you've got a fitness clause. So you're going to go, a parent is assumed to be fit until the state proves that either A, the parent has exposed the minor child to clear and present danger as a result of the parent's decisions, or B, the parent is incapable of meeting the minimum reasonable needs of the child for a significantly prolonged period. That would be abandonment. C, the parent is unwilling to meet the minimum reasonable needs of the minor child. And D, a parent knowingly and intelligently waives their parental rights. Now, you do not have to write a whole new legislative bill to incorporate this language into your statutes. I bet you, your state has child protection laws, right? Iowa have them. Right? They have child abuse, child neglect. That's all you're doing is you're asking that your family code statutes point to that section. And I'm going to tell you why that's important. What's happening in your family law cases is the judges are skipping some steps. They are not requiring that you have these causes of action in order for that other parent to proceed. Right? So when that parent files a lawsuit and says, I want custody of the child, we're no longer going to be together, we're getting divorced, or we weren't married, we're separating, or the dad says, I want to establish paternity, and I need a, an order that protects my rights to my child, what the courts are doing is using statutes that have skipped steps. And we all probably went through this in school when we learned math, what happened when you skip steps. Right? I'm sure you know. You're not young enough to remember, right? You skip steps. You didn't learn all the steps to division. What happens? You forget how to do it. You can't get the answer, right? Or you're not going to get the right result. So that's happening here is the judges are skipping steps and you're not getting the right results. And a lot of you, your judges are elected. That does not mean your judge is an expert in family law just because they do family law, right? It doesn't even mean that they're an expert in the law at all. I think there's some states where they're not even required to be a lawyer. Are they required to be a lawyer here in Iowa? Judges? Do you know? Okay. So the point is, is that they are judging a case they're supposed to be applying the law. You, your attorney, has to provide the framing of your case and provide that argument to that judge. That judge can only rule on or use the evidence that you bring into your court. Now that does not mean that the judge cannot use 
law analysis, right? It doesn't have to be brought in, but if you don't, you may not be able to argue later who made the error, okay? The judge can, on his own, apply legal analysis from the Constitution, but if they don't, again, and you don't bring it up, it's hard to, harder to argue fundamental error, and we don't want to see you have an error. It's too much, it costs you too much time. Okay? You guys want this to resolve quickly, then you've got to get this straight. And this is very simple. So you follow those steps, you say, okay, my law doesn't say they have to follow child abuse or child neglect standards. Does that mean you don't argue it? No. It means that you do argue in your court, you argue it also to your legislators, and then you have it on the record. So they may or may not follow it, but at least you try. Okay? That's going to also indicate to judges as new ones come into play, as new ones are trained, what you want as the public. Because that's a big deal, right? If your judges are elected and they have to be in touch with the community and your legislators have to be in touch with the community. So part of your living constitution is how do you exercise those rights? Well, you've got to let them know you want to, okay? So if you go in there and just say, hey judge, we can't get along, I want you to decide the best interest of my child, you're going to keep getting what you're getting now. Okay, so the third clause, or yeah, the third clause is the rights of fit parents. This is super important because earlier, before we came on the video, we were talking about what role the children have in this litigation, right? So you've got an attorney, and that attorney comes in, and you've got statutes that says, the court's primary objective is to look out for the best interests of the child, yet your child is not a litigant in this case. Your child is not even a party to this case. So you need to know what your rights are as a fit parent because that's what protects your child's rights. You protect your child's rights, as you heard when I started this and I read to you my author's final, final notes. Um, this is important as well because when legislators are sitting down with you to go over legislative bills, they are thinking about how are we to protect the children. And what's important here is you've got to get your mind around this a little differently. It's not that you're not protecting the children. It's that what do the children need protection from if the parents are separated? They don't need the kind of protection the judge is thinking that they're used to seeing when they have child abuse cases in front of them unless those are actual, you know, unless those are actual um, facts in your case. If there's no child abuse, there's no allegations, what are they protecting them from? What they should be protecting them from is the loss of either of the parents. So you need to get your head around that and say, no, you're protecting our rights to continue to parent this child and to continue to provide to that child all of their development needs. Okay, so the right of fit parents, that clause says, and it's a sub clause, fit parents are entrusted by nature or the state with determining the best interests of their minor child and must be assumed to be acting in their child's best interest and less proven fit. So that's already addressed in most of these equal parenting bills that I've seen circulating around. If you're mirroring the Kentucky bill, that's already addressed. That it's presumed that the parents are fit, that equal rights are presumed, and that's in the child's best interest. So you're good there. So you've got that incorporated. Let's go to the next one. The second subclause of the fit rights of fit parents is that each fit parent has the equal right and duty to direct and control their minor child's education, to include educating the minor child through personal example, which arises through routine parenting of the child. The child has a right to receive education from each parent equally. And these rights, I get to the page, are among the penumbra of individual First Amendment rights. So here's what's imp important here because I don't hear this being talked about when you guys are lobbying very much, and that's the First Amendment right. Has that come up when you guys are lobbying for the Equal Parenting Bill? Okay, let me tell you why that's important. There's equality and there's liberty, okay? Liberty is not as well protected like you might think. Liberty is harder for parents to fight for than First Amendment rights. First Amendment rights, that's where you get into the equal protections, right? 
First Amendment rights are the exercise of parenting, the actual influence you make on your child, right? You know the money that you spend on your child is also protected by the First Amendment? So child support could fall into that category, that you're influencing your child with the money that you spend on them, right? So First Amendment does need to start being addressed, as I think it helps you understand these in a little bit different way that's harder for them to, I want to say cheat you out of these rights, because that's basically what they're doing, okay? We've got some creative action going on around over here. It's like distracting me a little bit. Um, Thanks, guys. <laughs> so you're getting cheated out of your rights because you're not understanding how they work. And I can't go into too much detail here. I don't want to bore you guys. Um, I just want you to know what these clauses say so that if you don't have the book yet or you need this information right away because maybe you're talking to your legislators Tuesday, you don't have time to get access to it, you have it. The second sub clause, or actually we're on the third. The third subclause, the rights of fit parents, is fit parents hold equal rights and duties in the care, custody, control, and physical possession of the minor child. Any conflict between these rights must be resolved in as equal a manner as possible. Okay, so two things about the subclause two and subclause three is that if you're custody control and physical possession of the minor child is covered by the First Amendment rights, wouldn't that mean that the court has to provide you more protection than just preponderance before they interfere with it? Because how many of you are familiar with your First Amendment right to speech, right? Can the court come in and tell you, you know what, your ex doesn't like that you talk to your child. I'm not saying the content of the speech, okay? We're just making this ridiculous. They do not like that you talk to your child when you're, let's say, transporting your child to school, okay? Because people see you talking to your child, whatever absurd thing that they bring up. I'm terrible at coming up with examples, but they don't want you to talk to your child. Can the judge give them that relief like that? Can they say, all right, Bob or Bill or Sam, you can no longer talk to your child when you drive your child to school, right? If they do that, I can tell you right now, those get overturned in the appellate court, yes, even in family law cases. Those are called prior restraints. They are not allowed to do that until, right, until they have met the requirements for interfering with that First Amendment right. So what do they do? What can they do with your First Amendment right? We all have heard what the restrictions can be. You cannot yell bomb or fire or anything that alarms people to trample each other, right? To become alarmed and leave and endanger others, right? You cannot do that. So they can put limitations on your First Amendment rights, but they have to have that compelling state interest. And that's another thing that they are not showing in your case that we talked about earlier, make judges show their work. So if you can, in your legislative bills, just like Kentucky did and many states are doing now, if the judge does not provide you with that equal parenting time and the equal legal rights, then you need to ask them, in some states it's called findings of fact and conclusions of law, to put that down on paper for you. And that's super important because if they do not, and you want to challenge that in an appeal, they will tell you in the appellate court they weren't going to make the assumption that that judge met whatever requirements there are in order to interfere with that right. So you'll have a much harder time getting it done overturned. Okay? So that's why this language is so important when you're putting it in your legislative bills. If you put things like that, you might be more likely to get an equal parenting bill passed. I mean, you don't even have to necessarily, I, I'm not saying take equal out of your bills, but if your state's really, really, really against it, like Texas has been, try going with the First Amendment protections. Get a little creative here so you don't get shut down right away or your bill doesn't get killed by somebody who just doesn't like the word, okay? Go to our next section. And I hope this is helping you guys with understanding why the language is important and not to add extra stuff 
Um, and if somebody's trying to add something onto it, like um, earlier Nick and I were talking about uh, domestic violence amendments, things like that, that's different from this, okay? Stay focused on, we're talking about the core part of a legislative bill and how to fix your codes today. Then that would be another discussion about what they're trying to tag on or what kind of exceptions that they're trying to make. So the fourth subclause verifies that fit parents may entrust certain of these rights to others as they see fit without forfeiting their rights. This one's super important too. I've seen a lot of laws on a lot of parents talk about right of first refusal. They want it right now because so many of you are being cut down to nothing more than a periodic visitor. Even if they call it parenting time, it's so restricted and so limited. Some of you only get four days a month, some less. Um, Texas has standard, um, standard parenting time, standard parenting order, but they also have expanded standard possession. They call it standard possession order, SPO. Um, that's still first, third, fifth weekends. Depending on if you do get expanded, then you get Thursdays overnight every other weekend. Thursdays, um, I think two hours on Thursdays, the, week, the off weekends where you don't have them the whole weekend. You might be getting Friday after school until Monday um, when school starts. If you don't have expanded, you're getting Thursday night, 6 to 8, and then Friday when school um, gets out until Sunday at like 6. Okay. So your time is still limited. You, If you think about this, you've got a whole week where you may only see them Thursday, 6 to 8 p.m. And that's really what a lot of parents are complaining about. And so they ask for right of first refusal, or first right of refusal, whichever one you want to say. Some of them want to put it in the laws where the court's required to do it. Let me tell you why it's a bad idea. <coughs> it's a terrible idea if you're dealing with a narcissistic parent, because that parent is going to want to know your every move, every minute of the day, and as soon as they can attack you again in the court, and because you're already non-custodial, it's going to be real easy for them to strip more rights from you, or just make you bankrupt by dragging you back into court. It creates more modifications. It creates more perpetuation in the courts, okay? As much as you want to have your child during that time, it's just, it's just not a good deal. I've seen more catastrophes with it. The other reason is if you get involved with a new partner in your life, or if you just have relatives that come over and you want them to take care of your child during your parenting time and you have something you got to go do, let's say you're a nurse, you get called in during that time. If you have right of first refusal, you will never be able to allow any other relatives, any close friends of yours, any new partner to establish a relationship and care for your child out of your presence if that order says the other parent gets them when you are unavailable. Now some of those have time, times put in there, four hours, eight hours, ten hours, that you might be away. How do they find out how long you're away from your kids? Constantly harassing you to know your schedule. Do you want to constantly be under their control? So that's why we discourage it, and like I said, we get it that if the laws are disadvantaging you, that you're thinking it's... You're thinking that it's better than nothing and that you'd rather do that, but then also think about how hard it is going to be for you to try to enforce that order. And there's lots of other examples I can give you why it's bad. Um, something like if you do drag them into court and you try to prove that they didn't give them to you during your time, they may flip it on you and say you're harassing, right? Because the court's looking at them as they're the primary and they're the decision maker and they're making good choices and you're just now an, a nuisance. They also will look at, or possibly look at you as, um, I lost my train of thought, but, um, oh, they could place false allegations in the court to try to now make you look like a bad parent, and now you better be really rich because you're going to be in court for a long time. And you may even suffer being put on supervised, and your kid's going to get riled up again. It's all, it's a mess, okay? I can't even begin to go into all the examples. So. I think it's a bad idea. You guys might not agree with me, or you may. Think it through. That's what our job is. That's what we try to help teach all of you, is to think through all of the possibilities. And the reason it's important going to advocates like Fawn and AFES, well, AFES people connect you up with other ones if they know them in your area. Father's Rights Movement is because more of them can tell you 
what the possibilities are, what you might go through, you're stressed out. Your brain is taxed right now. You are not going to come up with all of these examples. You're going to miss things. You're going to miss obvious things and not even realize it. So you need that support from others as well. But get a good education. Make sure you're getting it from somebody. We prefer you getting it from us. We actually don't know uh, any other people that actually go into as much depth as we do with this education at this time. Um, we, we work with a lot of leaders. They're getting really good at stuff. So if you are going to one of them, let us know. We'll help you work with one of them too. We probably work with most of them already. Um, the natural rights clause is the next section. And that is the rights of natural biological parents are neither established nor granted by the state, but are self-evident rights that shall be protected by the state and by this amendment. The state may create legal parents where that creation does not unduly burden the rights of natural parents without their consent to the burden. Once established, except where specifically limited legal parents are granted protection under this amendment. The reason we bring up legal parents, um, it's not because we're trying to help the court take your child and adopt them out. It's because there are times when children are rightfully in a situation where they need to be adopted and I'm not making any claims or judgment on CPS or any of that, but let's just say it's not your child, it's just there's a child in foster care. Let's say that both their parents were killed in a wreck, okay? That's a legitimate child available for adoption. Well, now they have to make those adopted parents legal parents. That's the only reason that's mentioned there. We tried to make a comprehensive amendment for the U.S. Constitution, and we're sharing it here with you because your state laws do need to be comprehensive as well, and most of the time they do mirror the U.S. Constitution, and sometimes a lot of states have even more protections in their state constitution. So you want to look at that and make sure that they all blend together, and that's important because you want to keep the protections you already have while sending those down into the statutes that the judge looks at. Because you notice the judges rarely will look at your state constitution, right? So you've got you to pull that protection of those rights into this family code. The other part of it that I want you to understand is that these rights are natural for biological parents and they're self-evident right, self rights, right? And that the state shall protect these. Well, right now, the statutes in most of the states say that the state grants these rights. They allow these rights, they, um, you know, they're basically gifting your rights that you already had. I don't like that kind of language. I know a lot of you may not be able to get that language out yet, and you're taking steps towards, you know, getting the equal parenting in there first. But realize that as long as that language is there, you need to work a little bit harder in your court case with your judge to get him to realize that that granting word is actually, should not be applied unless they have already found you unfit and now they're trying to like um, rehabilitate the parent-child relationship, okay? So if you've been if you've been found to have some unfitness elements, there's 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 kind of a a uh, you're not naturally just found unfit. They should actually be holding proper hearings, which they don't, but let's say that they say I don't like this term, but they say you're not so fit, right? You're not a perfect parent, which nobody is. Um, and I'm not talking about better parent model. I'm just saying, okay, let's say you had some drug usage, you kind of fell off the wagon a little bit, had some drinking, maybe you even spent some jail time. Now you've come out and you've gotten cleaned up, you've recuperated, you've recovered, right? And you want that parenting with your child, and you want those rights restored. That's where they may be getting, you know, I still don't like the grant, I'd like the store, but that's where they rightfully, maybe if there's no other fit parent, or they, they maybe conveyed those uh, the other parent to exercise them for a little while, while you are not qualified to have those rights. I know I'm kind of stumbling over these words. It's very important how you word this, um, but that's why I'm saying you gotta understand what they're thinking when they think they're granting your rights back to you. They think you have no power. They think you have no power to say no. They think you can't argue with them. You've got to change the way you are thinking about it before the judge can change the way they're thinking about it. So you can find out more information on those if you um, contact us or um, look at some of the information we have on the blog. 
So the last one, or second to last one, is the care, custody, control, possession clause. Minor children have the right to be in the care, custody, control, and possession of their fit parents equally, and where no fit parents exist to be in the care, custody, control, and possession of the state. All other rights with which the minor child is endowed, but is incapable of exercising, are to be held in trust by fit parents in the first instance and by the state only where no fit parent exists. You, so you notice this clause is all about the child, isn't it? And I said the child's not party to the case, however the child's being affected by the case. So that means that they need to take into consideration the fact that the child also has a right to your care, custody, and control over them, your development of them. That's super important because if the judge really wants to look at how are they to address um, the way it affects the child, it's by protecting those rights. And how do they protect those? They protect your rights, right? The child's endowed with certain rights. You protect those rights. You help that child grow to an adult so that they can exercise their own rights. And the last one, the health, safety, and welfare clause. So it says, nothing in this amendment shall be construed as limiting the state from setting minimum equally applicable standards or regulation concerning the general health, safety, and welfare of its citizens. When rights between parents are in conflict and the state is asked to intervene, that intervention shall be the least detrimental to these rights, or sometimes you'll notice say least restrictive, where a valid question of harm to the child exists, the state may act to protect the child for the briefest time necessary to protect the child from that immediate harm. Here's why this is important. How many of you have seen temporary orders or even final orders? Let's go to final orders. Final orders that put a parent on supervised visitation. They never had any proper adjudication of rights, never were found unfit. They're perfectly capable parents and they're put on supervised visitation and it has no end to it other than when the child turns 18, right? Who can afford to take this back to court and have to suffer through everything all over again? Which by the way, in the state of Texas, you wanna check this in your own states, state of Texas, if you go back to court to modify, there's no longer a parental presumption and it's, I know I went through it, <clears throat> excuse me, and it felt just like I never had an order in the first place. They, it's like starting all over again. It was maddening. It was super expensive. It was frustrating. I had no idea. No lawyer told me that was the case. It wasn't until I did research that they told me that's what was happening. And then I understood what the problem was. When I was going through it, I did not understand what the problem was. And that's my last thing that I want to tell you guys is that you need to understand what the problems are and not just understand the problems, but what solutions to apply to those problems. But if you do not identify the right problems, you're not gonna apply the right solutions. These guys at FAWN, AFESP, um, and many other organizations, Father's Rights Movement, they are now trying to apply the right solutions to these problems, so you need to keep what you guys are doing, but also continue to teach other parents to continue to fight in their courts for these rights as if they're already there. It doesn't hurt anything you're doing. Thank you so much. I hope this helped you out. By the way, you can get access to this book. Um, if you want to gain access to it from the Policy Center, um, what we do is if you become a member, and that just means that you, you donate a minimum amount, you become a member, you can then have electronic access to this book. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and thank you to Paternal Guardians of Iowa and Iowa Fathers and all of our other co-hosts with this event tonight. Um, it looks during our technical difficulty, we might have turned on some celebration filters as well. So, uh, of course, it's a celebration because Sherry's here, so it works. So I don't know if we can get that off before we publish it or if those are going to be stuck on. But, um, of course, always something here in Iowa, especially with Dealey with me. But we do our best to get through. and. Uh, We've had a great night. Um, I know that now that we are all starting to get this unity coming together and all this momentum that we're going, people are really asking, what can I do and how, how do we get all these new people involved? So I want to let you all know that some of the easiest ways to get involved would be to um, write letters, whether be, uh, letters to your editor, about 250 words. You can write letters for our website and your other local chapters. 
Um, uh, there's getting involved with the campaigns of the supporters that uh, supportive candidates that you identify and knocking doors for them, writing letters for them, making phone calls, and of course, as always, going to our website to make donations because events and travel and um, printing of materials, everything does add up. So every donation, two dollars, hundred dollars, every bit does go a long way. But again, we want to thank Jerry Palmer, Paternal Guardians of Iowa, everybody else for watching tonight. It's been fun, and thank you all very much. Have a great night. Oh, I know, that's why it was when it fell. <laughs> yeah. It yeah. 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 yeah, it got really bad for me. You had big eyes, you were a wizard, you were a puppy dog, you were working out. And normally, I would have, I would have, like, written on my board. Like, right as you said the celebration, that's when it started going Because the, the rest of the time, I just had to Yeah, that's it. But so the title almost was better than it said right as I said. As you said it, all of a sudden, everything just, like, went off. And I'm looking, I'm like, this is... Exactly. I'm like, they can listen to it, they can write down the language to this one, you know, not to ask. <laughs> At least they didn't do it throughout the whole thing. Yes, know, it did. Oh, it did? Oh, it was the confetti part, though, right? Well, the confetti kind of came and went, and then it had little hats. <laughs> oh, it did? Oh, I didn't I had hats all the time. I was looking from here, I could get out of here. Oh, it just happened all the time, and I was like, I have no idea what to do with this. That's so funny. Oh, I love it. I love it. No, all the time. Usually when I'm talking on these people, they'll sit on the live feeds, they'll like go off and then they'll watch the videos later. Yeah, it's like, I was giggling myself, I'm like, oh my god, what am I doing this? I thought, and then the baby was just showing that, you know, she's doing this whole stuff. Oh, there we go. That's good, I needed that. At least it wasn't boring. They were all that intellectual. Exactly, I was sitting all giggling. It looks like most of it is just a confetti anyway. Yeah. It went dark and light. I mean, I and like, this is why I haven't been doing lives. Because my throat's been doing this. Well, it's like, so much easier to do the YouTube and put it on, and then if you say something stupid, you can not put it on. But you get the crowds. Yeah. I don't get any crowds like this. I have no idea. No idea. <laughs> <laughs> not, not on our page that we're I'm going not, to that, but. I don't get crowds. Up. No, anytime I do it on my business page, I'm kidding. If I do it on my personal, I do it. I want like to do it there because my dad jumps on and my sister. Right. Why? Right, what are you guys doing here? <laughs> I have like 
layers on under here, and it's like, yeah. You might be getting Friday after school. Yeah, you'd be caught up for a semester. I don't know, it's just a suicide code. It's a suicide code. See, the confetti spit is all that I can see from sitting over here. Yeah. I wouldn't have known that stuff anyway. So, yeah, they would have. <laughs> we can go back and look at it. Okay. That's fine. It's fine. It's just going through like a cycle. See, it just sounds. It's fine. They'll love it. They'll love it. I'm I think sure it's, what's it, 34 minutes long? So it's not too bad. Yeah, like 30, 40 minutes? It's not too bad. We try to keep it a little shorter, too, because they'll start to get bored. I'm not wearing this shirt anymore. Like, I'm just wearing my heart shirt. I'm not even wearing it. That's it. That's why I'm not wearing these shirts anymore. I'm like, I got kind of work shirts on the top. You're tiny. Good girl. What is that, dude? That's one of the general membership group shirts. So. You're like, uh, yeah. Hey, I'm happy because then they're looking at that instead of looking at there you go. <laughs> they're, they're watching for the next time the googly eyes and hat and hear it all pop up. Keep, keep You're going to get all kinds of weird comments. You're going to be like, Nick, what were you on? You're going to be like, were you one of those uh, military guys that tried that LSD? Yeah. Well, anyways, um, this was fun. But we ended right on time. So we can go to our next destination. So you want to call it out? Colorado's a different talk. I just did this here because you guys did the legislation, so um, more like lobbying kind of stuff. Colorado's um, Debbie Carroll and Gill, so Gill's working on federal stuff. Debbie Carroll is the radio, is the radio show, and then it fills the job. So it'll be a completely different format. This is the first time I've read the clauses from this book because I noticed more people are starting to get this book. Um, I couldn't mention membership site or anything in the Big Family Court um, because I'm representing the National Family Policy Center, but all of these books now, so they can get access to doing a donation to this one in the Policy Center, so we're licensing this one the Policy Center right now, but um, they can get all three of them in the Big Family Courts without doing the buy -in. So it's right now to $20, well actually two of them. $20 membership and they can do that and they cancel at any time. And that way they don't have to have them. $34.99, $5.95. And once it's get put in there, it will be like $20.99. But it won't go up. And the people are already in it keep the exception $19.99. So just so they know, because we're trying to get all the information as many people as possible. We need to get a good like, you know, page to our website to like, link back. Right. Well, but you, you're a nonprofit. You need to link to NFLPC.org, not to Big Family Courts, because then they'll complain about all of that. Because this is that's a you get the what uh, contents and uh, yeah, link and yeah. We'll go so we'll do that. And it, that's been frustrating. It's been hard for me to like like you to separate the two roles. Because yeah. I had to ask Ron, and I was like, well, this is Big Family Courts, can I use this? And he's like, yeah, we license it to you. Like, well, like, that's weird. <laughs> I'm like, how come National Family Law Policy, Policy Center doesn't have their own books? And he's like, well, lots of nonprofits have license materials. I don't know the first thing about that. I did proposal writing, and that was it. So I didn't, I didn't Personally, I'd rather they have their own books. Because I want them to think that we're doing it to make money. You know, pop. So I'd rather they have them. Could we get you to help take a couple pictures of us real quick? Yeah. Not with the pregnant shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so everybody we could get a quick picture. If that's how pregnant I look, we've been eating way too many snacks. We have. <sighs> Felt like I didn't hang from the down. I think I have. I knew my boots were tighter. <laughs> Yeah, Kelly's like, I'm going to get attacked. Kelly knows better. Come on now. Kelly, you know my fancy hats? No. Googly eyes. Fancy hats. And googly eyes. And I kind of want to block his shirt thing. Getting as close as we can. And you're nice and tall. Act like you like each other. Well, we can switch sides. Are you pregnant now? No, you're not pregnant. Don't worry. Okay. Well, I know I'm not. Back on up, Tom. 
Sure. I can't. My booty's too. <laughs> I don't want. I don't want like brush up against them. Let me see how they came out. What kind of angle you want? Do up. Do up. Do up higher. He knows. Oh, wait. You didn't tell me my hair was tucked behind my ears last time. Stay googly eyes. <laughs> I'm sure you'll see him post it. I'll tell you. Yeah. yeah. I, I I don't have the I don't I don't have the uh, liberty to care anyways right now because I don't have the time. Nick, by chance do you have a screwdriver of those? I know. My mirror is coming off and I'm gonna tighten it. I'll go through it yeah. Yeah. later. I need to. As soon as I got here, I lost two.